Hallelujah. Well, I'll tell you what. But Marty's my brother. Amy is my niece. Austin's her husband, and Debbie is my sister-in-law. And there's little... And, to, and, and you have a baby. I can't see if there's a baby behind. And the little precious. Oh, that's exciting. Hallelujah. Little Rama. And oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And little Luke. Uh, thank you guys so much for surprising me today. That's pretty awesome. So I have a lot to talk about today because I've kind of have been saving it up, you know, because I've been kind of... Uh, a little bit incapacitated the last few weeks, and so there's a lot of things I want to talk about. This, uh, this day, Resurrection Day, is probably one of the most significant days for me as a Christian, but also it, it, it is the thing about transformed life that is so important for all of us, and I really want us to capture something today. And I started the service this way, and I reminded us after the worship of just the idea that if there's anything that is in the way of us celebrating a risen Christ. And you have to, you know, nobody can answer that for you uh, because I think that the idea of a risen Christ, uh, you know, when it was first introduced, you, you know, nobody believed Jesus. No, nobody kind of, it kind of just blipped right over their heads. But, and, and then later on, when he actually did rise from the dead, there, there was mixed reviews about how it was received. And, and so I want to talk about just that phenomenon, and, and, and eventually I'm going to get to something. I want to talk about, there's about five things I want to share with you, five different areas, about how we can live in the victory of resurrection now, right now, today. And I feel like we need to get there. We really do. And out of Mark chapter 16, I'm going to read uh, the, the, the account there about uh, the day of resurrection. In verse 1, it says this, Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the, week, of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So just get the account. I mean, this is the day, they, they, they were all in one direction. Their minds and their thoughts were all in one direction. They wanted to honor Jesus. They wanted to finish what they started on Friday and, and to come and prepare him for burial. And so that was the intent. They didn't come to the tomb to see a risen Christ. They came to the tomb to prepare a dead Christ for burial and just to kind of say goodbye. And when they came and the stone was rolled away, uh, so often we're preoccupied with things. We're trying to figure out how are we going to do life, how are we going to figure things out, how are we going to keep going, you know, how, how are we even going to do the thing that we're setting out right here. They're on the road uh, to the tomb. How are we going to, when we get there, how are we going to get in? That was like, it's just practical stuff. And all of us live there. All of us live trying to solve our practical problems, trying to solve the things that oppose us, get in our way. And the thing was that the, the, the problem had already been solved before they got there. And they got there, and the tomb was open. And so they went in. And the tomb was not opened to let Jesus out. The tomb was open so that the disciples could get in. And, and, and it's, it's a, just a, a little, little shift in perspective because it's, it's, not, it's not so much about we got to help Jesus. It's, it's more about I need a revelation. I need something that changes my thinking. And so they came into the tomb. And they, they hear what the angel has to say. He is risen. He's not here. Go tell his disciples. He's going before you to Galilee. He gives them all his list of instructions. And when they leave there, they don't say anything to anybody. It's like they just freak out and just everybody goes their way. And, and, and it, didn't, you know, it didn't last because at, just a little bit later, they, they come and, 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 uh, and, it, and it says, uh, if you follow on the story, that later on, the disciples uh, get the news and they're totally unbelieving. And we're going to get to that. So five ways we can live from, the, from resurrection victory today. So you got to live, first one, you got to live from what you know. You have to absolutely live from what you know. See, truth is one thing. You, know, you hear the truth, you hear the scriptures, you, you, you might even believe them, 
but you hear truth, but it's truth plus revelation that brings transformation. Truth plus revelation that results in an encounter with God. Something shifts. You remember the road to Emmaus? Because after Jesus rose from the dead, he, he, he showed up on the road to Emmaus where two guys, two disciples, were on their way, and they were talking about all that had happened and all the things that, that, they, were, that they were sad about. And Jesus shows up. They don't know who he is. Uh, and, they, and they come to him, and, and they, they, he asked them, well, what are, you guys, what are you guys upset about? The, the one whose name Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And, you know, G- Jesus, Jesus is a master, isn't he? He's just like these leading questions, you know, like he, he knows exactly what they're struggling with, but still he asks them to, exp- to explain to him what was going on. And so they tell him the whole story. You know, we, you know, we, were, you know, we were expecting this was the one that was going to lead us in, in victory over the Romans, and then he's crucified. And then now this morning, every, we, there's so much confusion because now some people are saying, you know, some of the disciples are saying that he rose from the dead, and here we are, we're trying to figure it out, and we're trying to deal with our grief, and we're trying to deal with all this new information and Jesus says to them in verse 25, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter in his glory? And beginning at Moses, so he went all the way back to Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. Wouldn't that be something to actually hear Jesus explain himself? Instead of what we, we, we always get to hear what other people have to say about what Jesus meant. But what if Jesus were able to explain himself what's going on? And the thing is, Jesus explained everything those two disciples should have already known. He didn't bring anything, you know, he didn't introduce a different Bible. He didn't introduce a different, different prophecies. He introduced all the same prophecies, all the same accounts, all the same qu- series of events, and he just explained them, and what they should have known, they were finally hearing. And then uh, it, it says in verse 28, then they drew near the village they were go- where they were going, and he, in- and he indicated that he would have gone farther. So he kind of led on that, oh, no, I'm not stopping with you guys, I'm going to keep going. And, but they, could, they constrained him, saying, abide with us, abide with us, stay with us, hang out with us, spend the night. For it's toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. And now it came to pass, as he sat at table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. So they didn't know who Jesus was. They didn't know that this was the very one they were, they were being sad about, that he was gone. But when they sat down together, and he broke the bread, then they saw and they understood. Now, isn't it interesting that for most of us, we think that if you give me the information, if you tell me what happened, then I will understand. They did not understand. They heard all of the information. They had all of the revelation. But it wasn't until they abided and broke bread with Jesus. So it wasn't, it wasn't the information. It was the fellowship and participation. It was coming and sitting with Jesus and actually listening to him and receiving from him what he had to share with him. And... and that's when they got it. It wasn't one second before that. And then when he disappeared on them, because as soon as they understood that it was him, their eyes were open, then he was gone. He vanished. And th- they said to one another, didn't our hearts burn within us? You know, like, we should have known. Why didn't we know? And sometimes our heart knows more than our head knows. Sometimes it's, it's what we're feeling and what we know to be true, even though we can't explain it or we can't somehow put our finger on it, we know that that's what's true. So we have to understand that we've got to lead with our heart in some of these things. And so when, you, when, when I tell you to, we have to live from what we know, some of what you know, you don't know yet. You don't know it in your, you know it in your head but it hasn't become a revelation to you. It's just like the people at the tomb when they, when they went in and they, and they scattered because they still didn't believe it. They, thought, they saw an empty tomb. They had an angelic revelation, and they still didn't understand that what had actually happened. And then the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they still didn't get it. Jesus is walking with them. They don't understand that this is something that's totally different. The world has actually changed, but they didn't understand it. It wasn't until they sat down with Jesus and they said, stay with us, abide with us. And in that place, eyes were opened. And in that place, now we had, we had a burning in our heart, and it, but we didn't understand what it was saying to our head. 
but now we get it. So we have to learn how to live from what we know. Listen to your heart. Listen to what God is saying to you. Listen to the things he's shown to you. That's how we start to live in the resurrection victory. We have to listen to what's going on inside. And then you have to believe what you know. It's not enough just to know what you know. You actually have to believe what you know. Uh, The capacity to believe is an incredibly powerful catalyst to living in victory, to living in, in, in the heavenly realities. So, you know, we had, for years and years, my, it was the first cat that, was, that lasted, he lasted 18 years with us, and my, son, my oldest son was four when we got the kitten, and he lasted all through their growing up. Well, I haven't told this story in a while, so I think it's about time. It's funny that you guys are here to hear this, but uh, his name was Rowdy. He lived to be 18. He may have lived longer, we'll never know, but he lived to be 18. When, when Rowdy was about 15, he got run over in our driveway by someone who I won't say who it was, but, you know, they know who they are. <laughs> so he, he was gone. I mean, you know how you see sometimes, you know, you see a cat and it's kind of flat, so you know this cat's probably not going to make it. So we put Rowdy out, because like, you know, he wasn't going to last. So we put him out. We got this nice blanket, and we just put him out to enjoy his last, his last day on the earth and in the sun. So we, we left him there for a few minutes, and we came back. He was gone. Just gone. And so we looked everywhere for him, you know, because I've had cats before that they crawl off and they die somewhere. So I figured, well, I guess Rowdy just crawled off somewhere, and that's it. Didn't see Rowdy for two months. No Rowdy. We're pulling in to the driveway, Kim and I, are coming back from somewhere, and we pull in the driveway, and sitting in the, gar- in the carport is Rowdy, as large as life. I mean, just like totally 100% fine. Okay, now we're going to have the correct story, I guess, yeah. <laughs> you're not on. You're not on. Maybe we should leave it that way. There you go. So, sorry, guys, but... So uh, we were in the car getting ready to pull out. Oh, is it backwards? Okay. And we're, you were looking back over your shoulder, and I think I was too, and I said, wonder, you know, wonder whatever happened to Rowdy. And then we turned around, and there he was right in front of us. So it wasn't... Okay. Okay. So I stand corrected. Yeah. That's a better, but, but that's a better version. I like happened. that better. I mean, how Later was this. It was a couple of months at least. It was a couple months later. And I don't talk about Rowdy every day, but I said, I wonder what happened to Rowdy. And then we turned our faces around, and there he was, right in front of the car. So, so that it was, was miraculous. So that was, my first, that was my first understanding about what it's like to get resurrection information <laughs> in your head that actually... I can't believe this is true. I mean, and, and so I, I had really renewed sympathy for the disciples because it was, he was standing there in front of our eyes. So I'm not trying to compare our cat to Jesus, but, but it's, it's, it's just something that is, it just puts you in the same place. So you've probably had something happen in some place in your life where you saw something that you knew nobody was going to believe that you actually saw it. And you didn't have your phone with you, you didn't have a camera, and you just like, ah, how am I going to express this? How am I going to tell? Nobody's going to believe me. And, and the thing about some experiences, like, you know, uh, Chris, my son, just sent me a picture of a tortoise on a rock out in the middle of a lake that he was just on a hike, and, and there was this big old tortoise there. And so he had to send me a picture, right? So, so that was just something, you know, but that wasn't like unbelievable. It was kind of like, wow, that's kind of cool, and now I, now I know that's what he saw. But there are things that happen that you know nobody's going to believe you. And the resurrection is one of those kinds of things. The resurrection is like one of those things where unless you are absolutely convinced, because you've had somebody tell you something, that they they look absolutely shocked, they look emotionally impacted, they are so persuasive when they're describing to you what they saw, that you, you don't doubt them. You just said, wow, that's incredible. You believe them, because there's something about their belief. There's something about how they've embraced what they've experienced and been able to translate it into something that is communicated. See, because you, if you don't have the capacity for what you say you believe, you won't be able to communicate it in a way that changes somebody else's life. 
you have to absolutely be convinced that what has happened has changed everything. And when you are absolutely convinced that what has happened, that Jesus is alive, that has changed everything. Hallelujah. And just so you know, Rowdy made it another three years after that. So, so that's pretty incredible. So John chapter 3 has an interesting account. It's when Jesus was telling Nicodemus how, you know, how uh, people are born again. And Nicodemus is having a hard time embracing it. And he says, you know, how does that happen? Do you have to go back into your mother's womb? And then Jesus answers him and says, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? I mean, it's like, this is like so basic. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we've seen, and you do not receive our witnesses. Jesus mostly is talking about himself. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So earthly things, what does he consider earthly things? Being born again, having salvation come to you, believing in God. These are all things that he, he puts in this, this basic category. And then he says, there's another level. There's another level. If you can't believe this stuff, you are never going to get into the advanced class. You are never. If you can't get arithmetic, you'll never be in calculus, right? But if you can understand these earthly things, if you can embrace them with your faith, then that sets you up for the heavenly levels, for things that are higher. And then verse 13, this is, I love this verse because it's just so freaky. It's, it, verse 13 says, no one, nobody has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. Now he's talking about himself, right? Nobody has ascended. This is before the crucifixion. So what he's basically saying is that Jesus has been going up and down and up and down long before he was crucified. So that's interesting to me. So no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, and here it is. That is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Okay, you figure it out. You explain that to me. So he ascended to heaven, he came down from heaven, and he is in heaven. All at the same time, all right now. How will you believe heavenly things if you can't believe earthly things? Something has to change. We have to have a capacity developed in us for higher level experiences. We have to be able to embrace stuff that is beyond our brain to figure out and understand. We, if we can't get there, we, we're never going to be able to embrace this stuff, this higher, this, th this heavenly realities. Now, here's the thing. Um, unbelief, we're, we're going we're gonna to read this account. And I'm going to come back to it. Uh, so verse, this is the, the account going on in Mark chapter 16, verse 9. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Okay, that's the first level. After that, he appeared in another form to two as they, as they walked and, w and went into the country, those two guys in Emmaus. And they, were to they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. And later, verses 4 14, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Okay, all of that unbelief surrounded the resurrection. We don't like to focus on that. We look to focus on the empty tomb and, and the glory of resurrection. We don't want to focus on all of our inability to actually get, even with him right there, that he was alive. So Jesus had to come in, and he rebuked their hardness of heart. And here's the thing. Unbelief comes from a hard heart. It doesn't come from unbelievable information. When you hear something that's unbelievable, and you don't believe it, unbelief doesn't come from that. Unbelief comes from a heart that doesn't have capacity. It comes from a hard heart. And the only way to fix it is not to be persuaded. The only way to fix it is to repent of it. That's where it starts. If you have to start at repentance in order to get to the place where you can be persuaded. So if you don't, you, don't, you know, here's the thing. So a lot of us, because I'm like this sometimes too. Are we cynical? When some, we hear something, do we doubt it? Are we, are we always questioning? Um, but that's okay. 
That's okay. But when we make ourselves the arbiter of what's true, that's not our job. Holy Spirit's job is that. What's true or what's not true belongs to the Holy Spirit. When I decide that I am going to decide what's true or not true, that's hardness of heart. Because either I've been discouraged in the past, I've been let down in the past, somebody's fooled me and I've been tricked, or whatever else is going on, I've somehow built up barriers to faith or to believing. You know, we, used to have, we, we had this joke for many years, and every now and again it comes up again. Uh, Kim would have this expression where he would say, this is it, because something incredible happened. And we thought, now this is the breakthrough. Breakthrough. Everything is going to change from here on out. This is it. And, you know, our friends in Tacoma, they would, they would laugh about it. And we'd all have a good time laughing about it. But we loved it. Because if you have a heart that every time something incredible happens, you're thinking, oh, this is not gonna, that's not going to last. Or that's not going to happen. That's not going to keep happening. Because you've got this resistance inside of you. But if you have capacity to, to say, this is it that you can embrace things, and you, can, and, and you don't have to understand every little thing, that you can say, that you can suspend unbelief and disbelief until you're persuaded. If the first words out of your mouth are always, that's not true, I don't, I'm not saying it's true or not true. Okay, it could, maybe it's not true, but that's not the point. The point is, where does your heart come in? If your heart comes in, on the side of just being totally shut down and cynical and doubting, and I am, you know, nobody's going to pull the wool over my eyes, that's one thing. But if our heart can say, well, you never know. I don't know everything. I haven't experienced everything. This could be. I don't know. So I'm going to wait and see. Just having that attitude changes your capacity to believe. So, so when you hear Jesus is risen, don't be like the disciples. Don't be like those ones at the tomb. Don't be like the ones who heard it yet could not believe it. And I understand because like I'm, I'm back to the story with Rowdy. That, that, that was unbelievable to me because it was the last thing I ever expected to see, yet I saw it and I had to make an adjustment, you know, up to what, what was my world at that particular moment. And you see, we all have to make the adjustment that we don't have a Christ that's still on the cross. We have a Christ that's risen from the dead. And even though we don't see it with our eyeballs, we have to see it with our heart. And we have to completely be captivated by it to, so that we get to the place where I now have the capacity to tell you about what has transformed my life because I believe it and I know it. You also have to receive what you believe. This is the third one. You have to allow what you believe to penetrate you to your core so that it can change you. So receiving is both passive and aggressive, okay? So receiving is like, you know, when you, you sit out in the sun, you want to get some rays or you want to breathe some fresh air, and you just lay there and just allow the sunshine to just shine on you, and you ah, feel so good. Okay, that's passive. That's one way that we receive, you know, letting down our guard and just being open. Another way we receive is like when you're looking for that last parking spot on Chris, when you're shopping for Christmas, and there's three cars on the next row, and you're trying to get there first so you can get the parking spot. That's aggressive. <laughs> Some of us get more aggressive than others of us in moments like that. But yeah, so there's passive, just receive it, man. Just open your heart. And then there's aggressive, grab it with both hands. Grab it with both hands. What you believe, don't just let it happen. Go after it. John eleven twenty five. 25. This is in the past, I don't know, seven or eight years, this verse has become very important to me. It comes up, and it has to come up on Resurrection Day. This, that if it's, there's no other day, I'll bring this up, but it's going to have to come up today. Jesus said to Martha, when he came to raise Lazarus from the dead, uh, I am the resurrection of the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, not that he will die, he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. If that doesn't mess with you, I don't know anything I could say that would mess with you. You may die, you shall live, you live and believe in me, you'll never die. 
And then he asked this question. This, this is really important. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Because that's what we should all be asking ourselves every time we read this passage. Do I believe this? It's, am I going to just passively say, oh, I'm a Christian, Jesus rose from the dead? Or am I going to aggressively lay hold of his resurrection and saying, yes, he's the resurrection and the life. He is in me. He is bringing life to my mortal body. Jesus is alive. And see, that is a shift. You have to ask the question. And, and I, it's worth pointing out. I pointed it out before, but it's worth pointing out. Martha answered him the question. And he said, sure, he's going to rise from the last day. You know, sure, I believe he's going to rise at the last day. Because most of us are going to say that. Most of us are going to say, you know, you know, resurrection. Sure, I believe in the resurrection. Someday we'll all be raised. Someday we'll all be glorified. That's okay. That's true. That's, that's biblical. And, but when Jesus asked her that question, he wasn't talking about the end of the age. He was talking about the next five minutes. There's a difference. He was talking about what was just going to happen right now. And, and you see, we have to move our time frame. We have to be more immediate about how, how much is the resurrection going to affect my life? How much am I going to allow the resurrection to affect the life I'm living right now? Am I going to put everything about it way in the future so that, it, you know, it's going to have to happen after I die? Well, I tell you what, it's a lot easier to experience life while you're alive, you know. <laughs> so I want to experience life now. And sure, there's going to be a time where our bodies are glorified, there's a redemption that takes place, there's an ultimate thing that happens. But if I place everything about, the, about heaven in that category or in that time frame, then I am going to miss so much about what Jesus died to pay for so that I could have it right now. So you have to maintain awareness. And maintaining awareness about Jesus being alive, it's a discipline. It's not just going to happen. You know, like some people believe, some people don't believe. No, you have to discipline your thinking to stay aware, to stay engaged. Otherwise, your belief will become dogma. Your belief will become a tradition. It doesn't become something that is vibrant and alive and changes you. Your belief has to change you today. Today it has to. So this is something about uh, living from victory. You know what it looks like? It looks like generosity. Living from victory looks like generosity. It's what we do to break up the fallow ground of our heart. Because if you, if you allow your heart and your life to stay closed and say, you know, I, I don't know if I have enough for anybody else. I don't know if I have enough to share. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about life. I'm talking about yourself. I'm talking about the things that matter to you. When we just live in a closed way, see, that's, that's living uh, out of the idea that somehow I've got to protect my life. But when I change and I'm going to live out of res resurrection victory, what that means is I'm going to be t turn my focus outward and I'm going to allow generosity to, to be the thing that multiplies life in me. You see, you've got to break up the fallow ground. You can't let uh, anything that maybe has discouraged you or happened to you or hurt you in any way, let it somehow limit how you share your life. Here's the thing about survival mode. Okay, you know what survival mode is, right? I mean, you know, it's when you know that you are just about to die. Some, something's going to happen, and you're living in a way that I just got to make it. I've just got to survive. And I've been in survival mode at different places in, in times of my life. So I know, I know survival mode. And the thing about survival mode, what it does to you, it gives you tunnel vision. See, because there's a whole world around you. There's so many good things happening around you. There's so many people that you could bless or that are open to being blessed and, and, to, and, to, and to changing lives and to, and to participating in what God's doing in the earth. There's so much of that. And to be a part of it. But what survival mode does is it narrows your vision down so you can only see the little narrow strip right in front of you that is going to be the next breath you take. And if you can make it that far, then hallelujah, now I'm living because I've survived. But it's not. It's not the kind of life that Jesus wants you and me to have. He wants us to have abundant life. He wants us to have not just life, but life more abundantly, John 10, 10. So the fourth thing, if we want to live resurrection victory now, you got to always apprehend your life. You, and what I mean by that, life is given to all of us when we receive Christ. 
But if you don't lay hold of it with both hands and just say, I am determined to live fully alive, fully alive. I am determined that nothing is going to shut me down or slow me down or keep me down. I am going to live fully alive. So sickness, adversity, failure, defeat, these are the kinds of things that will loosen your grip on the abundant life. It, when these things start to barrage you or th th they happen to you, you're, you, you might be totally taking, I, I'm living the abundant life, I'm serving Jesus, Jesus is on the throne. But when you have these things bombard your life, what happens is it can, it can weaken your grip. It can cause you to feel like, well, maybe not. Maybe I've run my course. Maybe this is it. See, you have to intentionally choose life in every adversity you face. You just have to. The, the victory of the resurrection is true and life-changing even when you go through struggles and challenges. Jesus, when, G when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he stayed four more days before he got there where he was. Why? Everybody told him if you'd come, he, you could have saved him. If you, if you came on time, you could have raised him from, you know, you could have not had to raise him from the dead. You could have just healed him and everything would have been great. But Jesus stayed four more days because when Jesus is going to do something or when God has something, he said it was for the glory of God that he waited. And we think of something as hopeless, you and I. That's our, that's our limit. When we think about this, it's just hopeless. It's impossible. But what we think of as hopeless and impossible is different than what God thinks of as hopeless and impossible. There's absolutely nothing that God says, I can't do it, or it's too late, or now that'll never happen. None of that. And you see, if we, if we don't understand that we've got to apprehend our life, we're not going to be able to embrace resurrection life. We're not going to be able to have the victory in our, in our daily living. In, in, in the fifth one I want to share with you is that create resurrection momentum in your life today. Start creating momentum in your life. And what I mean by momentum, it's the unrelenting forward movement of your faith, of your hope, of your joy, of your victory. It's unrelenting. It doesn't matter what comes against you. You just are going to move forward. One of my favorite verses is Romans 8, 11. It says this, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, you know that phrase, he gives life to your mortal bodies? Sometimes people think, you know, they talk about it as being, oh, yeah, that's about when you get raised from the dead. That's when, you know, you die, and then, you know, then you're going to get raised from the dead. But giving life to your mortal bodies, the phrase actually means giving life to your dying body. You know, every single one of us are moving through life. We're aging. Things happen. And our bodies are mortal. The idea of being mortal, the word for death, muerte, comes in Spanish and in Latin, comes from this word. It's, it's mortal. It means that there's a beginning there's an end. So what happens when the spirit of resurrection comes and lives inside a believer is that now there's this, this unrelenting life force that's inside of us that is giving life to our mortal bodies. And we're designed as believers to be carriers of life. We are designed for that, life, strength, health. So last Thursday night, I'm going to share this. Most of you weren't here, but, but last Thursday night, you may have heard, uh, I've, been, I've been preaching since I was 19, so I'm just about 50 years now. So I've been preaching, and what happened last Thursday night has never happened to me in 50 years of preaching, but it happened last Thursday. So what happened was I had been fighting a serious infection, and I thought I was past the, the worst of it, but I was actually not <laughs> past the worst of it. And I was just, I was up here about 10 or 15 minutes into the, into the teaching, and I could not continue. I just, I just, like, I, I was overcome by nausea. I was just feeling, like, incredibly sick in that moment. And, I, you know, thank, thank the Lord for Bruce, and Jonathan Bigelow came, and they, they actually helped me from the stage, from the platform, and Bruce had to finish the teaching for me. Um, I went to the ER, and, and I'll tell you, something like that, 
that happens to you. And you know what I was teaching? I was teaching about the authority of the believer. And I was sharing miracle stories. I was sharing all these healings. And then I'm being helped off the stage. And I'm thinking, Lord, what kind of a testimony is that? That's not going to, that's not very good, Lord. I need to, I need to do better than that. And the, and the thing is, is that no matter what is happening to any of us, no matter what our experience or our struggle or our challenge or our sickness or our defeat or our failure or whatever it might be, no matter what is happening to any of us does not change truth because truth is not depending on my experience. Truth is, is depending on the reality of a risen Christ. So I, I have to bring my subjective experience in submission to the reality of who he is. And that's what I mean is that it, we have to apprehend life and we have to create our own momentum. See, because if you wait for the momentum to come on you, when you feel good or when something good happens or when you feel like, you know, hallelujah, everything's going my way, now I've got some momentum, that's the wrong time to create momentum. Momentum, the perfect time to create momentum is when you feel challenged and when you feel like you're struggling and when you feel sick and when you feel like you don't have the strength to continue something, then that's when momentum shifts in. You have to move into that. So you can't make room for it. And, he, and, and I want to make a, just a, a, a statement here is that people get sick. I got a testimony on that. Uh, people suffer. People, people die. People, things happen because we live in a, a world where that, that happens. That's a reality. But we don't have to make room for it because it's going to happen when it happens. But I am not going to make room for death in my life. I'm going to make room for life in my life. I'm going to make room for victory in my life. That is what I'm going to focus on, and I'm going to create a bigger space in my capacity through what I choose to know, what I choose to believe, what I choose to receive, what I choose to apprehend, and what I choose to create in the momentum of resurrection life. And see, we all need to be living this way. And I, and I felt like it was important for me to talk with you about, you know, I'm not going to give you all the grisly details of my, of my health struggle because, I've, you know, I've been, I've been fighting something since uh, the end of the year, since the end of 2023. And, you know, I think I'm getting the victory on it, comes back, you get the victory on it, comes back. And so, this has been an ongoing thing, but I just want you to know that it's not where I live. It's not where, where my heart is, and I just encourage you because it's so easy to be susceptible when you feel, when you, you know how, what happens when you feel sick? Everybody treats you different. When, you, when you're sick, people treat you different. And then, uh, you know, you're in, the, you're in the hospital, and then you're, you're, you know, you're surrounded by sick people, right? And it's like, ah, I don't want to be here. You know, you go to the doctor's office, and it's like people are just crawling in and crawling out, barely making it. And, and, and you, I do not want to live there. Now, I'm, I'll go through things, right? I mean, you can't ignore when you go through something. But the thing is, is if you allow that to somehow define who you are, to somehow say, I am now a weak person. I am now a sick person. I, I am not. You know, the, the, you know, the whole term, the spirit of infirmity, the spirit of infirmity literally means a spirit of weakness. It's what it means. And so when, when people get sick or when people suffer from things, and there's, no, there's not a clarity about it. That infirmity that makes them infirm, it actually is weakness. And you accept it or not. And so I choose not to accept that. I choose to embrace and to receive the spirit of resurrection that the truth of the Bible tells me lives in me. And if I choose the spirit of resurrection, then it is giving life to my mortal body. And I believe that that's where victory comes from. So you, you, you have to make resurrection something that is part of your life in such a way that it's not just something you believe is a tenet of faith. If it's, just a, if it's just a box you tick off that says, I'm a Christian, and says, so, you know, Jesus is the Son of God, check. Jesus rose from the dead, check. Uh, I have repented and believed and, this, you know, and received the forgiveness for my sins, check. Now I'm a Christian. It's not enough to not embrace life. Because the whole point of salvation is eternal life. And eternal life, if, you, you know, you've heard me say this lots of times. Eternal life is not what happens after you die. Eternal life is what happens when you meet Jesus. It's what happens when you enter a relationship. It's, what, it's like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. You sit down with him, and in the breaking of the bread, you know him. And it's in the knowing of him that resurrection life comes into you. And that's when you are not like those disciples that just couldn't believe. 
that just, they, couldn't, they couldn't get their head wrapped around the reality of something that was dead coming to life. See, we have to, we have to come to grips with this ourselves. each one of us. How am I going to live my life? Am I going to live my life like there's a risen Christ? Or am I going to live my life like it's just something out there that I believe and I've checked the box? I just want to challenge you to that. And, you know, that doesn't mean you'll never have problems. It doesn't mean you will never get sick. It doesn't mean you won't face challenges. What it means is that you face those things out of victory, not out of any kind of defeat. So happy Resurrection Day, okay? Yay. Why don't we stand and pray? And uh, I'm sure there's lots of hams that need attention or whatever it might be in your, in your home. I just bless you today. And I, I pray that, that the, the, the things I've shared with you today, that they don't freak you out too much, but that they inspire you to reach for something more than maybe you have in the past. And so, Father, I just pray for every person here, everyone that joined us on Zoom today, God. We just pray that the reality of a risen Christ would just overcome us and overwhelm us in our thinking, Lord, that we would embrace the truth of the risen one in our lives today, that the spirit of resurrection would, re, that would release victory in every part of our experience in our life. I just bless this day, Lord, it, for every family, for every person here, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you.